Hello, I'm Shubha Patak, and I'm an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion at American University. My new book, Divine Yet Human Epics, Reflections of Poetic Rulers from Ancient Greece and India, is a work that treats two different questions. The first is, why is it that the term epic, which is a term in English that derives from a Greek word that uh, was used in the classical period to describe the Homeric poems and the cyclic poems, which treated some of the same characters, why is it that this term in the 20th century is transferred to these monumental Sanskrit poetic compositions that are similar to the, uh, hero to the Homeric poems in having stories of heroes uh, and their accomplishments, etc.? Well, I think that scholars did, made this move because they wanted uh, to see what was familiar about the Sanskrit poems, in other words, what they shared with the Homeric poems, and the, using the term epic helped to familiarize these unknown works. But I think what people need to see now that the, we have a fairly long history of uh, Western interaction with these works is that it's important to see that the Sanskrit poems themselves bring something to the term epic because they themselves have unique characteristics different from those of the Homeric poems and the fact that they're called epics causes the term epic to change as a result and so this is something that I explore in the book and uh, I think sort of sets the stage for my second uh, type of inquiry. The second inquiry has to do with uh, why is it that epics continue to endure today what is it that they do that causes people to pay attention to them even now, centuries after they've been composed? Well, I think what they do is they offer ways to solve these major existential problems that humans have been confronting for centuries. And these problems may vary from culture to culture, but generally uh, all human beings share them to some extent. It may just be the priority that differs across cultures. In the ancient Greek culture, one of the things that uh, stands out is this anxiety about what will happen to me after I die. This is the question that people ask themselves. And the way that the Greek tradition handles it is by uh, presenting an ideal, what I call a religious ideal, kleos, uh, heroic glory. Um, and what the Greek tradition does is present heroes striving for it in individual ways. So however they uh, accomplish this ideal, uh, it's unique to that to each particular hero. And so uh, what you find then in the Greek tradition is the symbolic representation of that through uh, kings or uh, rulers who act like poets themselves. And they do this because they're anticipating their own poetic immortalization. And what we find then is that heroes tell different types of poems depending on what type of approach they use to achieving this ideal. Now, in the Greek tradition, what we find then is we have a hero who affirms uh, the ideal, uh, Achilles. He's someone who's who has no trouble achieving Kleos. He's the uh, son of a goddess, um, Thetis, the sea nymph. And he's known from a young age that he's going to grow up to kill Hector uh, in the Trojan War and to achieve Kleos himself when he dies in battle. Now, because he knows this, he can just simply sketch at what is going to come in his life, in his little poet, poetic performance, which happens uh, when he withdraws from the Trojan War. He strums on his lyre, sings the Kleandron, the uh, famous deeds of men, and then goes on uh, to kill Hector and to die in battle, as I mentioned, uh, achieve Kleos, and that's that. It's it, it's very pat. It's it's quite clear that that's going to happen. Now, much different is the story of Odysseus in the Odyssey because Odysseus is someone who struggles to achieve Kleos, and the Kleos that he achieves is different from that of Achilles. Rather than die on, dying on the battlefield, he comes home from the Trojan War, and he finds himself having to rebuild, re restore his own kingdom, restore his family to its pre-war condition. And so this is something that allows him to uh, achieve, this is what he does to achieve Kleos, but what happens is that his own story, the stories that he tells in anticipation of doing so, uh, have a much different character than what Achilles presents. His, uh, Odysseus's stories are uh, more uh, deliberate, they're convoluted, they're, uh, they question whether or not 
uh, he will achieve success in his aims. And while he does do this and he does uh, anticipate his eventual success, overall his works uh, have a much more uh, woeful quality to them. They are much more um, so reflective, wondering whether uh, he can achieve this ideal at all. So in the Greek tradition then we have an affirmative epic, the Iliad and uh, Achilles song goes along with that, and an interrogative epic, the Odyssey, and Odysseus's own self-doubts uh, mirror that as well. In the ancient Indian tradition, what we find is that the existential question is a different one, or at least the one that takes priority, which is, how is it that I will achieve, uh, how is it that I will behave morally when the world around me, when the time around me is growing increasingly immoral? And uh, what we find there is that the Sanskrit epics take a similar approach to the Greek epics in that they have an epic that, there's an epic that aff affirms this ideal and there's an epic that interrogates it. But because dharma is a socially constituted ideal, this type of righteousness that people learn how to acquire by following the examples of others, uh, we find that the heroes in these epics, rather than performing their own poetry, actually listen to poems about heroes who achieve dharma. They're actually told by uh, rulers who have connections to uh, people who achieve dharma, either uh, because they're relations of them or because they uh, happen to be those people themselves. So what we find then is in the Ramayana, the hero Rama listens to his twin sons, Kusha and Lava, identical twins who are identical to Rama in appearance as well. They tell the story of Rama and how he's going to achieve Dharma in the future. And so it's a foregone conclusion, much as uh, Achilles' own performance of Cleandron was, a, as, was simply an anticipation of his own achievement of Cleos quite easily. In the Indian tradition, we also have an interrogative epic, the Mahabharata, and its hero, Yudhishthira, listens to another ruler, Nala, who experiences some of the same self-doubts that he does. He's someone who is not sure whether he's going to achieve dharma in his time. Um, he has trouble uh, maintaining his wife, he has trouble maintaining his country, and uh, Nala, the ruler that Yudhishthira listens to, has these issues as well. And his poetry, as a result, comes out in these little poetic fragments, uh, these little laments about what he's lost and whether, you know, qu the question whether or not he will ever get get it back. Now, Yudhishthira does achieve a kind of success in the Mahabharata, but it's not anywhere near what Rama achieves. And so, I think in this set of epics, as in the Greek tradition, we have both. Uh, models of mastery of a particular ideal and models of coping, try, just trying to get by and do the best we can as we try to achieve this ideal. And I think what causes uh, these poems, the epic poems, to endure is the fact that we as humans have both impulses. I mean, everyone has moments when they feel like they can master something, that they are in control of their destiny. And everyone has moments when they feel as though they, the fates are conspiring against them. And so what these epics do is they, they capture this dichotomy that we experience as human beings and they present it to us in entertaining educational ways and uh, as a result we remember them. I hope that you'll remember my book. It's Divine Yet Human Epics and I hope it, that we get a chance to talk about it again sometime. Thanks.